we're going to re record hers at a later date and put it up on our social media and on our um, web page. So you still won't miss out on that. And there is a collaboration that Bibo and herself are doing with the um, South Bank Centre. So I think Bibo is going to touch on that likely too. Um, so apologies if you came here to listen to Simone, but there's loads of other really cool, talented artists um, speaking. We've also, Joe unfortunately had, um, couldn't um, last minute come along, so we're missing her. Hopefully she'll record something for us too. But we do have four, yes, four still amazing people coming to share their art with us. So we have Paul Bristow starting off and he's just the kind of storyteller from SCAN. That's a Scottish Climate Change Action Network, which is a great organization. And if you're not already a member, then I would advise that you become members. Um, he's done lots of podcasts with organizations, um, helping them to uh, tell their stories. And Bebo is uh, one of our stalwarts at the Climate Cafe, who's also an amazing multidisciplinary artist, along with her partner, Brian. Um, and she'll be talking about her art and showing that today. And Kim is also speaking, last but not least. But in between that is Grace Banks, a storyteller who's also, I think, done a lot of cool projects. And one of them she'll be talking about today is about school children. Um, and Kimberly is a writer in poetry and prose, as well as a prize winner and all the rest of it. So we're really excited to hear her speak too. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is talk about what's coming next and then pass you on to the speakers. So as you know, every first Tuesday of the month, we have our Climate Cafe. So next Tuesday of the month will be the 5th of January, and that will be on rewilding. So come along, same place, same time um, on the 5th of January. There's also a, a SCAN event. Uh, it's the Community Action Collaborations. Dunbar is doing What If Network, and that's all about re-envisioning your community. Um, so if you're interested in that kind of um, event, then go along and learn more about that. And also there is an event, a webinar on community energy and the local electricity bill. Now the local electricity bill has recently been put forward um, to uh, a lot of MPs and a lot of them are enthusiastic about it, but we want a big push about that. So all the details for that is on the powerforpeople.org.uk website. Um, so if you want to know more information about that, go to their website and also with SCAN as well. Okay, so, and as you know, we can also oh, look at our media, which is um, Aberdeen Climate Action at Facebook and Instagram and also LinkedIn. Um, so you can follow us there too, and all the details will be there and on our web pages. Okay, so I'm going to pass you over now to our very first artist, Paul. Um, and after the artists have all spoken, then Adam is going to take charge from then on in along with Jeff. So I'm passing it over to you, Paul. Now take it away. Thank you very much, Alison. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for, for having me along. So if you just give me a wee second, I'm going to share my screen with you. One moment. Okay, everybody seen that all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I've been working for the Scottish Communities Climate Action Network to collect and share stories of community climate action, primarily using podcasts. But I've also been delivering training to sort of help people tell and, and share their own stories. And well, there's so many ways to access stories now, really, from, from podcasts and, and community radio to, to, to blogs, Instagram, all sorts of ways. But there's some principles uh, that I think are, are worth keeping in mind regardless of the medium, right? Regardless of how you're doing it, there's some, there's some things that are always good when you're telling stories. And I thought that tonight, what we'll do is kind of briefly chat a bit about that. So a wee bit of story science, and then finish up with a sort of a practical thing for you to have a wee try at, if that seems all right. Um, but I'm going to start uh, with a story. I always like to start with a story. Um, and uh, this is a traditional story called Anansi and the Pot of Knowledge. Anansi is the spider king, lord of all the stories. Sometimes he looks like a spider, sometimes like a man, but always he's a trickster, trying to get one over on folks. Now Anansi was already clever, but he figured if he gathered all the wisdom of the world, he could keep it hidden away. Then he would be the smartest creature in the world. So he gathered it all in from the wise folk in the secret places, all the wisdom of the world, 
and he'd sealed it in a pot. And Nancy knew where to hide it, at the top of a tall thorny tree in the forest. And Nancy's son and Kuma saw him sneaking into the trees and decided to follow. The pot was too big for Nancy to carry while he climbed the tree, and he kept slipping back down. He got angrier and angrier each time. Tie the pot behind you and you'll be able to climb properly, said Nkuma. And Nancy was so annoyed that Nkuma was right that he let the pot slip and it smashed and all the wisdom fell out. And just then a storm came and washed the wisdom into the river and from the river they washed out to the sea. And then all into the rivers around the world and into all of us. Anansi and Kuma walked home in the rain and Anansi was a little wiser because what's the use of all that wisdom if a child has to put you right? The illustrations for that story were done by an artist called uh, Barry Robertson. Anansi's stories are the best um, but there's, there's also maybe some sort of relevant symbolism I think there in terms of the suggestions of young people being ignored or people greedily trying to control resources, in this case the resource of wisdom itself. I also think there's something in the idea of us all kind of holding on to our stories when actually they're much more valuable when they're shared with everybody else. And that's the beauty of folk tools, you see, because they, they sort of speak to us on a fundamental level. They work so well because we can project our own feelings and understanding onto them and make them timeless. Stories that succeed, which are remembered, retold and shared, have that kind of universality, have something that we can connect to, an experience or a feeling that we recognise. And they're all around us. It's just down to us to frame them the right way and tell them in the right places. And there's a reason that we talk about story more and more now in terms of marketing, in terms of uh, change or, or entertainment. It's because we understand it a lot more than we did like, even 20 years ago. We know now that it impacts memory, we know that it creates neural pathways, that it impacts on empathy, generates empathy, even. we know it can make a difference. So to help make a difference, we can all have to become storytellers, going where the stories are being told and sharing what we do, what we see, what we believe, which I'm sure is what everybody who's here tonight does. And it can be tough sometimes to do that because not everybody's a natural at that, not everybody likes the sound of their own voice, but actually, the voice is the most important bit. Not how it sounds, but whose it is. See, we need a range of diverse voices, a wealth of experiences, an abundance of ideas. We don't just want to hear from people who work in projects telling us what they're funded to do. We want people who volunteer and access services who are out doing their own thing at the weekends trying to make a difference, community organisers, people challenging current systems thinking. All of those folks, emotional connection, that's what we're after. Which is easier said than done because the first hurdle that you'll usually come up across and certainly one that I've repeatedly bumped into across Scotland and I'd have to say especially in Central West Scotland um, which, is, which is where I'm from is that sometimes it's difficult for people to believe they've got a story that folk want to hear. Um, so as an example, uh, here's my own hometown of Korea. Just on here. And um, well back in, the, back in January um, we were uh, revealed to be the most deprived town in Scotland, according to your Scottish uh, Index of Multiple Deprivation. And then six weeks later, it was swiftly established that we were also the COVID capital of Scotland, um, with infections and fatalities up to three times higher than the rest of the country. And yet, that managed not to be the story that we told. Instead, our story became one of mutual aid, of resurgence of community spirit and in particular how climate action focus groups were the ones in the area who came to the forefront of the community response whether that was in recycled bikes for key workers or refurbished laptops to homeschoolers who were identified at most at need this this here was a story that the town chose to sell about itself rather than the story that would normally be told about us and sure enough the fact that we were a covid hotspot um, with a responsive community and near enough to Glasgow, then the news crews then started coming down to, to film us and talk to people in the area. I think, honestly, Inverclyde's been on the news just about every week since. Uh, last week we were 
on with something about school dinners in the area. The week before that was on Radio Scotland talking about our Halloween festival. The door was open. All these stories had always been there, but suddenly people were listening. Now, these things happened, I'm sure, in your area as well, right? They, they happened all over the place, but circumstance suddenly made them newsworthy in Inverclyde. And the sharing of that story has had an impact locally. If you've ever done any reading on story, in particular the, um, the sort of principles of uh, myth and, and fairy tales, you'll maybe have heard of uh, Joseph Campbell's sort of hero's journey. Um, it suggests that story cycles across all cultures kind of follow the same repeating patterns. The person's called to adventure, they say no, they refuse, and then gradually they transform into the hero. It's not perfect. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a wee bit gendered in its approach and it's a bit focused on Western story structures, but we still see it at play. It's still something that's well used, particularly in like the, the story structure blockbuster films, you know, sort of the three act structure of, of films, or in the beginning, middle and end that we're always telling uh, primary children to write in. But when we're talking there about fictional stories, there's actually, there's, there's a similar point that's just as important in, in community stories, and it's this midpoint, this moment of change. Even in community stories, we'll see that. There's, there's a moment where, you know, there's an activity that needs to happen in your community, or um, we, we decided to come together to make this change here because there's a point where you go from not doing the thing to doing the thing, and seeing that moment, probably the most interesting part of the story takes place. And that's kind of the bit that I'm trying to speak to and hear from other people. That midpoint, that whole storytelling approach is sometimes called going into the woods. And I really like that. It's that sense of moving into somewhere unknown and magical, a kind of a, a different place that's symbolically unknown. When we're trying to create change using stories, finding the moment of change in your own story is really, really important. And it's something I always invite people to reflect on. Arguably, we're at the moment of change in the climate crisis. Some people would argue that we're, we're past the moment of change. And there's not that many heroes turning up, loads of villains, certainly. But that's the bigger picture story, really. And that's, that's the narrative. And the narrative of the climate emergency is frequently one, which is sort of a, you know, apocalyptic or, or explains the terrible danger that we're in as a planet and as a species. You'll have seen this image, I'm sure, shared a few times. And it's, um, it's, it's effectively some facts, but presented quite negatively about how the richest 10% are responsible for 50% of the world's CO2 emissions. About even just living in one of these countries, we're responsible for contribution to climate change, even if we adopt a greener lifestyle. And it's hard not to feel hopeless in the face of that. It's hard to feel you're making any difference at all, in fact, arguably, that's perhaps the whole point of this story and how it's been framed. There's so much scientific data now. I mean, people should just understand, surely. Well, no, because it's not just how you structure a story that's important, it's how you tell it. And just because something's factually true doesn't make it meaningful. The reality is, if a story is meaningful, people are more likely to believe it is true. And this is perhaps the most famous and, and potentially controversial example of that. But you only have to stray into COVID-19 discussions in Facebook groups to see similar situations play out. Some people want to believe the virus is a conspiracy because that's actually marginally more comforting than thinking that people are not in control of this absolute chaos. Other people want to believe that they can do their bit to, to help to make a difference. People want to believe things that make them feel safe, in control, in the know that make them feel right. So how else can you make things meaningful? The best recent examples are stories that affect change and actively disrupt norms, have at the root the story of one individual. And those stories were, were quickly added to and expanded on to create whole new genuinely world-changing narratives that challenged society. And that didn't happen by accident. These stories here and how they were crafted were weaponized to force change quite purposefully. But let's be realistic, because I've got about 15 minutes and I don't want to barber on and on. I want to give you something practical, doable, that you can use. And there's loads and loads of story stuff online that's really useful, but I particularly like the work of Babette Buster. And she has a book called Do Story, which is used in lots of community settings. And I think these are the core principles 
that I'm always working to and that I would invite others who are looking for stories within the communities to work on as well. So the first thing is tell your stories if you're telling it to a friend. So, you know, be conversational. That's especially important for me when I'm working on podcasts, which is, you know, can be quite an intimate sort of experience. It's, you know, you're in somebody's ears talking to them all the time. So you want it to sound like a chat. You want it to be more of a conversation. It also creates a connection and a sense of empathy. Explain place and time and all that, but keep it simple. We don't need to know what day of the week it is unless we really need to know what day of the week it is. And keep it simple and active, active verbs, moving the language along really, really quickly. Juxtapose, mash things together that don't seem like they normally go. That's always a great place to create a story. So the idea of Inverclyde being a deprived area where lots of people work together for, for mutual benefit, that was unusual, so it became a good story. The thing that's most important, though, my favourite thing, is the gleam in detail. One wee moment that captures um, the essence of what you're trying to say. So, like, just now, and in fact, you might hear from them next week if you're along, and, and I was doing some podcasts in Dunbar, and um, there, there was a group who were talking about, they have this Apple Day, where, you know, the whole community just comes together, and they, they sort of, you know, they, they cook, and they laugh, and they, they play, and they, they, they sort of make a maze, and they have these Scottish heritage apples with all these amazing names like the bloody plowman and all of that stuff and then and then these wee moments where you hear about a place or, or or a bit more about why people are drawn to a place you can start to see it and when you see it that's when you start believing it that's when you start understanding how important it is to people be vulnerable i love stories where people learn from mistakes because then they seem more like me you know then they seem like, they're just like the rest of us. There's not, there's not a, a hierarchy of how we're trying to work on this together. That's a really nice thing to do, to open yourself up to that. Tune into your senses. Again, in the stories from Dunbar, there's, there was another story which was all about the cooking and the taste of new foods. When we hear stories about uh, the lockdown, the, the notion of birdsong frequently comes out as a sort of a, you know, a contrast to the, the, the silence. Bring yourself. Now, this is the toughest one for people sometimes. Because it's your story or you're involved in it. And if you are, you need to be in it. You need to, you need to put yourself in there. And that can be tricky, especially as how we feel about ourselves might change from week to week. But don't shy away from it. It's your story to tell. And then stop. Um, not just structurally, but also because people are used to short, digested chunks of information, like, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Not loads and loads and loads, unless you're, you know, making a TV box set or something. So, mostly, up to now, we've been talking about stories that already exist. And Anansi, who we heard about earlier, is part of the creation myth of, um, of Ghana. And um, creation myths are the stories we tell about ourselves and how we came to be. They're important culturally, but we also have them in, in organisations, we have them with friendship groups, we, we have them as countries, as nations, all sorts of different ways that we do it. They, they sort of define who we are. Recently, you might have heard talk of something called control mythologies. And control mythologies are the parts of life which are presented as self-evident truths, things that are too big to change. That's just how it is. There's, there's nothing we can do about it. Things like um, there'll be a technological solution to the environmental crisis or that all economic growth is good. And already we can see the control mythology of the new normal um, being asserted, pushing us all swiftly back to this unsustainable status quo that existed before the crisis and it's framed in all sorts of ways from moral duty to saving the economy to civil liberties happiness even and it's hard to counter the comfort of what normality used to mean after a period of upheaval like this the new normal hasn't asserted itself though now and agents of change which is what you all are don't accept the control myth as the terms of the debate. They just, that's not, how we, that's not how we start talking about our story at all. Now's when we get to tell the stories that define what the new normal might be. And that's the space that I think we should work in, where I've been trying to work. And it's maybe where stories might work for you too. Believing that the world was ending used to be much harder. But in the face of a crisis like this, people have still been trying to get on planes. You know, we, we've still been buying cut price meals, we've been queuing up to buy fast fashion, and I'm not judging any of that because we've all got our own normal, our own barometer of risk. But I guess my point is, if an actual live pandemic won't change behaviour, who's to say the climate emergency will either? 
So instead, let's look at the things that have changed and build from there. More people want to keep working from home. More people have recognised the importance of a green recovery, of a greater appreciation of the outdoors. More people understand the environment around about them. More mutual aid groups are working in communities than ever before. More people have understood the realities of supply chains and food resiliency. The wellbeing economy is now genuinely and seriously being discussed and debated. So if we can do that now, why can't we keep doing it? If they can do that, why can't we? What if we just kept doing it this way? Creating that inspiration and that dissonance, that's how we create stories that influence change. What if it isn't the apocalypse? What if things can only get better? What if that's what we told stories about? And we talk about a crisis of imagination quite a lot. And we have to be careful when we do that, not to sound like we're condemning people because they've got a lack of imagination. That keeps people at a distance and it excludes folk. Rob Hopkins and others talk about um, the redistribution of imagination to get back to a place where imagination is not luxury. And that's what I think evenings like tonight are all about. So we should absolutely be telling stories of our future, which is what I've already been hearing from folk in new community food networks or rewilding groups or any of the amazing other folks that I've met over these last few months. That's one way of doing it, which links to how I'm doing the pod uh, podcast, obviously, but it doesn't need to be how you tell your story. The principles that I shared very quickly there um, are also useful for telling stories of the future. The gleaming detail, that imagining the, the thing that's going to change, all of that can be done. And I'm going to set you a challenge now to do just that. Uh, a wee bit of homework. So, as you'll have heard, these are all being filmed for sessions this evening. And um, you can come back to this bit, right? You can come back to this bit later and do this next activity now. So I'm just about finished, but what I want you to do later on, you get yourself a piece of A4 paper, like so, and fold it. And fold it. And fold it again until you have folded it three times, giving us eight wee segments, right? And then what I want you to do is fold it over. Grab your pair of scissors and cut along, not the open edge, but the closed edge. Cut along just to the middle. Right. And then what you've got is this sort of flap here, right? And you kind of look, it's kind of a quacking duck, Pac-Man type thing you've got there, right? And when you fold it over, like so, you a diamond, peering through the diamond, and then push it together, and then fold it again, right? And what you will then have, put it down flat, is a wee book, like so. It won't fall apart. Right, and you number the pages in the book one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You've got eight pages there, eight pages to, to share a story, right? And this is the story that I want you to share. You see that I've given you eight different sections, so a thing for each one of those pages, right? And you can either tell me a story of today or you can tell me a story of tomorrow, right? And there's a wee bit of guidance there for what you do for each one. I don't just want you to tell me about what you do though, right? I want you to tell me about how it feels to do what you do. Find the gleaming detail, like a day you work with the school to plant trees, or the day that your um, first community food initiative made soup together and all sat down to eat it. It doesn't need to be world changing, it just needs to have changed you a wee bit, a wee bit, to make you realise and think that things could be, could be different could be better or you can share a story about how you're going to make things better in the future right one of those topics on each page right and ideally normally when I do this I do a lot of comics work and I'll be asking you to illustrate it so do make a picture book even if it's just stick men right and then keep this book for yourself put it on your shelf and when you're not sure about what it is you do or why you do it you can remind yourself with this book or give it as a gift to someone else give the gift of imagination so, so it's a cheap Christmas gift that you can do for everybody. So I've been recording these stories with Scans for about, for about three months now, and we haven't quite got to a thousand better stories yet in the podcast. It's more of an aspirational uh, title than it is a target. Um, but even just this last month, I've been hearing about sustainable community woodlands, communities doing food resilience studies, ethical shopping options. And once you have the stories, there are other ways you can use it. So right now, for example, I'm working with Abriac and Forest to, to tell their stories a comic. I've been speaking to groups who have created downloadable maps of the 
climate areas, the climate action groups that are happening in their areas, or people who are using story maps to share visual data, all sorts of different ways you can use and tell that story. And sometimes it is good fun just to, you know, revert to, to type and expectations. And so our Christmas podcast, I can get a wee plug in that before I finish, uh, is all traditional winter stories this year with an environmental theme because sometimes people do just like a good fairy story. So there's my details there if you want to get in touch with the story you might have. I'd love to hear from you and to work with you. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody else has got to say this evening. But thank you for, uh, for lending me your ears for a wee bit of story chat. Thank you very much.